Hello guys, welcome back to Break the Mould, episode two. Uh, we're really excited today. We're joined by Mike Worley, uh, who's a founder, former founder and director of multiple mechanical engineering businesses. Um, recently sold his last shares in the business last year. Is that right, Mike? That's absolutely right. Yes. Yeah, and he's here today to, he's unemployed, by the way. <laughs> unemployed, <laughs> retired. <laughs> we're still retired. Retired, bad school, so trying to work it yeah. out. Um, but now on a serious note, we're really excited to have Mike with us today because um, it's someone that me and Chris have known in business for a long, long while. And recently we, we got back in touch and Mike's been helping us with a few areas of our business and he's got a remarkable brain on him, uh, as you're going to see in the duration of this podcast. But I think, you know, for, for us, Mike, and to, to those, obviously, obviously people watching this, they might not know you, but we're going we're gonna to deep dive into the story. But your business journey didn't start from you actually starting stuff from scratch, did it? It was actually your dad who owned the business. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, essentially... It's a family business. Yeah, it's a bit more of, of um, what's termed a lifestyle business. So uh, it looked after. You know, I was one of five boys, so quite a wow. reasonable size family. But um, a family business, so it paid for all of the holidays and um, you know the day to day living that us as a family enjoyed. And we all kind of got involved in bits of it from time to time, uh, counting and doing stock checks in the stores at the nice. age of. Nine, ten, yeah, probably before it was technically allowed with <laughs> work permits and all the other things back in those days. But still, we have the safety training was oh, absolutely, yeah. it's all absolutely <laughs> spot on. Um, but it gives you a good grounding and knowledge of the products that you know later on I um, mm. was getting involved in uh, selling, buying, stocking, yeah, you know, all the other aspects of the uh, the business, yeah. And how, how would you even at that early age when you're kind of like doing the summer, you know, so summer work in there, etc. How would you describe your business acumen at the time? Obviously inexperienced, obviously, but did you, do you feel like you started to understand just by being in the environment, the acumen, understanding what was happening from a commercial yeah, perspective? I think if I'd have achieved my academic outcome, I was fairly practical, so I've got like, you know, woodwork O-level, that type of thing. O-level, what's that? O-level, yeah. That's, that's, what's that's, an O-level, Mike? Yeah. It's, it's, it's an, an ancient <laughs> qualification. <laughs> Um, Get served with like a little feather and grill. <laughs> uh, and technical drawing. So from an engineering point of view, which is what our business was in anyway, mechanical yeah. engineering, you've got a degree of understanding about the products and design and that type of thing. Um, but I'd have probably gone down the uh, the more analytical route and, and was originally looking at doing accountancy. Really? Um, I think in reality I was probably not analytical enough to feel comfortable in that environment because it's yeah. you know it's it's very much about the uh, the numbers and the creative side was yeah. um, was something that was of interest so um, and it so wasn't yeah. I wouldn't recognise it as being business acumen at that stage you know when you're ten eleven <laughs> uh, working through your summer holidays for a bit of extra money um, it's uh, and and through those periods of time I did a lot of sailing so I was nice. probably more focused on that as a yeah. an activity um, but when I was probably in my early 20s the decision was you've either got to go down a career route yeah. or carry on sailing and enjoying you know all the, the activities around that and, and was that your decision or was it your parents forcing you that no way? that was my, my decision it was, uh, really you know um, it uh, you, you, there wasn't enough time to do both yeah. At the level I was doing it at the time. So did you ever go to college, university? You never went down that route? You went straight school. into straight So into I was in school. the, you can leave at 16, uh, which I did. Um, I with the O-levels? With O-levels and I think a CSE. Which was, CSE? Which was, which was, was the that? one if you didn't, you weren't quite good enough for the O-level, you did a CSE in uh, English, but you know. Okay. Uh, it's all right, spell checker and gram checker these days. <laughs> on, you don't need it. Do you? Um, but I, I started working at the business, and at the time, you know, riding a moped, twenty something miles to and from work yeah. um, each day uh, in the winter was uh, uh, quite a commitment to uh, to be part of, you know, understanding yeah, the business yeah. more. And so was that sorry in Charlottesville already? Were you living in? No, that was up in uh, lived in Northampton, and that business at the time was in Leicester. Wow. There was a division in Chalmers in Eastley. Yeah. Uh, which was part of the group at the time. Um, you know, I remember years ago when we came to look at the premises that uh, we then occupied wow. uh, in Eastleigh. So um, we'll it, was, it was part of a, a bigger 
group that my father was um, was part of in, in you know the good old days. I yeah, suppose. yeah. And um, you did mention it was like at the time before before recording. You said it at the time it was more like a lifestyle business. Yeah, my, I, I think um, for anybody who's started a business and you know, gone through the growth of uh, of a business, there's a lot of commitment needed, and I think. Um, it certainly wasn't uh, the management team that were in place at the time weren't I don't think the uh, uh, focused on that kind of growth of the business so it was very much a small there was not yeah. any real growth to the uh, the size of the business mm. um, I'd liken it to um, and there's a culture and an attitude so when my eldest brother and I took the business over and started running it when I was about 24 yeah there was a very deliberate approach from taking it from being a, a lifestyle business to a commercial entity and treating things in the way in which you've got to earn money first and that's the business has to succeed and you grow it um, as, a, as a business entity rather than considering you know, what your earnings need to be and, and you guys will know that, you've sacrificed yeah. your earnings to, to allow the business to succeed and to yeah. grow. So I think there's a there's a definite approach to that, and it. Uh, but but why? Because so because you know it sounds like it's already a functioning ship, you know as as you said you know we've got to go on the holidays etc. Why did you actually want to turn it into a, you know a, a real always being competitive? Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, being competitive is you know it's a, um, a, a a bed partner with being ambitious. So you've got to you know you can't. Sitting where you are, doing eat, sleep, repeat the same every day yeah. is, is you know you, you always strive to do more and be better. Yeah. So you know it it went from employing probably fifteen people when Richard and I took it over to the peak we had about one hundred and twenty people. That's so awesome. it's a completely different organisation. Yeah, yeah. And acquiring businesses, acquiring product lines, doing all sorts of things. To, yeah. To and keep pushing. I want you to take us through that journey from fifteen to. Hundred and wherever it was, and so so just just so just so we know where we are in time. How old are you when you and Rich get the keys? Um, <laughs> I, I think I was twenty four. Twenty four. <clears throat> when so, I first became a director. What was that first week like? Well, it wasn't really a formal. Um, oh, okay, we, it wasn't really a, a formal process. Uh, we used to tell companies how. Part of it was on <laughs> the back of you know my parents going in different directions. Okay. Um, and my father stepped back from the business. Um, scary meetings back then with bank managers mm. because technically uh, and I'm pretty sure if the business was in the same condition with the way banks operate today it, it wouldn't have been allowed to continue really? doing what it did so it's kind of a failure no option position to be in and yeah. taking that responsibility on at that sort of age um, was you know quite a yeah quite a challenging um, interesting time so, so talk me through that day when you had to walk into that bank. What a <laughs> why were you there? And B what, the, what happened in the conversation? Well, <laughs> and, <laughs> and can you just let everyone know what the glory days were like in banks? Qu by the way, <laughs> <laughs> quite a complicated. You know, when you've got uh, a divorce going on, yeah, shares of the business, yeah, uh, your mum's house is part of the security for the bank. Um, so it's a, a very complicated environment. Um, and I remember sitting down with the bank manager, um, lovely chap, who spent the whole meeting doing this <laughs> to the point his face, was, his forehead was red. Yeah. <laughs> where he'd been rubbing his. And he had the authority to make the decision back then. Bank managers fill out forms, collect data, yeah. send it off to a risk team, they put it through a computer. It's all automated. And yeah, literally. It's a yes or a no, and it's, you know. So it wouldn't have happened now. He. He had the confidence to see what you know potentially we were capable of achieving, and he put the uh, um, the tick in the yes box and continued supporting us at that time. Mm. And what happened? What would have happened if he didn't? Yeah, um, it it collapses like a pack it of cards. Collapse. Really, you know, if the bank say they want their debt, mm. then you know, Mum would have essentially had to sell her house to release the equity from that because the bank, the business didn't have the cash to be able to do it at the time so it's a pretty you know um, but you as an individual though Mike like parents getting divorced young 20s about to go into business with your brother like what was the emotion like at the time 
I, it was all a bit of a whirlwind at the time, really, because I was doing lots of sailing and trying to do that, and that was the decision where I had to yeah. kind of make the decision. You have to step into the business world mm. um, because there just wasn't the time otherwise. So, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of upheaval, a lot of things going on, a lot mm. of, you know, the whole family was emotional. I still had, my youngest brother was still at school. Wow. Um, so, you know, you've got to um, do what you can to look after him. My next youngest brother, he's in the printing industry, so he was actually sailing the seven seas aboard ships doing printing activities. Yeah. So it's all, it's, you know, it's, um, my recollection of it is you just got to head down, ass up and get on with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, right, so you're in the, you're in the business now. You know, at this point, you know, we've, we've got a couple of O levels under our belts and some CFEs. CFEs. Certificate of Secondary Education. I yeah. Know, yeah. Or something silly. And so, what I need to understand is like, cause obviously, and we'll, we'll talk about this, but when, when you talk today and you, you, the way you break down like the components of a business is, to me, like me and Chris sit here, it's like, wow, it's just like the mm. way that you kind of get that granularity level. But is that is that just picking that up through experience? Like for example, when did you know that you needed to write the first business plan for the business? Well, I think probably take it back a, a layer. Um, my view on people who are keen on being in business is that you're you've got an element of pre-programming and pre-wiring. So you know, you take some of these amazing artists who can do things which I just can't. Mm. You could get the best art teacher on the planet and I still couldn't draw. It's not something I can do. But there are people that are pre-wired and they do it naturally without any effort at all. And I think to be a, an entrepreneur, you have to have an element of pre-wiring that puts you in the position that you can turn that um, personality or traits or whatever it is that you've got into being part of understanding what makes businesses tick mm. and having the belief and the commitment to be able to get on with it so I think there's an element of that that you need in the first place when you're then either by design or default dropped into that environment I think some bits you know the only real advantage I think I've got over you guys is experience and there's no shortcut for that yeah. you've got to go through those those elements you've got the drive you've got the motivation you've got the vision you've got the belief, well they're all massively important factors into starting and, and achieving success in a business. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I think you know, the formality of it, you know, I was fortunate I did understand numbers, so um, being able to put that together and understanding accounting and, and bookkeeping, which I think is incredibly uh, important. Um, and then it's just create, you know, it's looking for the opportunities and having the vision to turn those opportunities into um, successes. Mm. And you know, we were in a position where actually a lot of the, a lot of the diversification we achieved over the years actually landed in our lap. But really? you've got to recognise it as an opportunity when that happens. I yeah. think you guys have seen similar things, you know, in the way in which your your business has diversified over the, yeah. the years. So, so would you describe yourself as at the time chief strategist slash salesperson? Um, not chief, no. My brother and I kind of concentrated on different areas of the business. Yeah. So, what did that what did that look like? So, you... so I concentrated on uh, importation and distribution, the, and 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 our background was very much the pile them high, sell them cheap mm -hmm. market. So it's in the days when importing from the Far East was a complicated process. Mm -hmm. International currency trading wasn't that simple as it is today. You can do it from your phone, it's easy peasy. Um, we used to use a thing called a telex, which you probably have never even seen one. No. That's that? before facsimile. So it telex was... Facsimile? So fax 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 well, you know, fax, fax machine. machine. Yeah. That's a full word. <laughs> Wait, I've, that's revolution. Facsimile. Facts is short for something. Facsimile, yeah. yeah. Guys, I told you, watching this podcast, <laughs> yeah, you're going to learn. Gonna learn. <laughs> so, before facts, simile, facsimile, before facts, it used to, international communications used to be done by a device called a telex. Mm. And a telex was basically a typewriter 
Yeah. And as you typed the message, it would give you the ticky tape. You know, you've seen it on the old films. Yeah. That, oh, yeah, yeah. Kind of that wide, and it's just got holes in it, punch tape. Um, so when you've got your message right, you allow your, uh, you dial up the number of the receiving telex and you put your bit of paper in and it types ah, the note as it goes through. Ah, um, so and it was an authenticated yeah. method of communication. So it was a legal, essentially a legal document because it was always started with your, um, co your call sign effectively. Mm -hmm. Ours was Rollway 47798G. Well, I can remember <laughs> praising some of the things I remember, <laughs> but that's that's you know that's the way it used to be back in cracky nineteen eighty nine ninety that time yeah. that sort of time. Wow. So um, I concentrated on the importing of products, and we bought yeah. products from Europe and the Far East. Um, and you know, back in those days, it was only what we've just gone back to now. Mm. We used to have to import from Italy and France and Germany. It wasn't a free market back then, so you had to have customs, you had to have clearance and all that sort of stuff for European products. Um, and it had a, uh, it was an opportunity that we built a distributor network. Um, so effectively what we were doing with our wholesale retail business yeah. was it had the buying power of 10 other distributors. Mm -hmm. So we, we operated it in two different environments. And we, we worked very hard to make sure that you know confidentiality existed with the other distributors so they didn't feel threatened by uh, the fact that we existed in the same marketplace as them as well. Um, and that was the back, you know, the original growth of the business from mm. uh, the smaller um, lifestyle sort of business into this much larger business that we were at one point the largest importer of seals into the UK. Yeah. And was that like a organic kind of like was just did it organically grow or did you have to really yeah, kind that's, of that's work it you know coming at it from two sides so because we had a distribution network yeah setting up distributors and we ended up with distributors not just in the UK but in um, Southern Ireland Spain um, um, we worked very closely with the guys in Australia and America. Um, so we built up a cooperation and, and my side of it was to support them winning new business which they would then place with us so giving them technical support giving them marketing support um, to, to help them achieve more success in their markets mm. so, so we doing a lot of traveling at the time then yeah quite a lot of uh, traveling I mean the next nearest distributors were from here Birmingham Kent and they were strategically spread out around the country because we didn't want them all on each other's Toes, yeah. doorstep um, we didn't you know it's a very complicated process trying to set up distributors that essentially operate in the same market yeah and trying to get them to cooperate and work together rather than just trying to compete with each other yes yeah. all that does is drive the price down yeah so I always talk about there's a lot of victories in business but there's also a lot of things that might not go right in business were there any of these distributions that you set up that didn't go quite to plan or Kind of failed, or did the, did the whole doorstep no, approach I go think wrong? I, so um, we were very lucky, actually. I think I mean, we picked. They were all independent companies, and that was deliberate. Um, so they were all, you know, small local businesses. Mm. They weren't national concerns. Although with acquisitions, we ended up in supplying national companies. Mm. We also, because we very much supported the factory to become much more technically capable. We became a, um, a a brand seller, so we were manufacturing on behalf of very well known mm. UK and European brands mm. and manufacturing their products in the Far East. So, um, when was the first acquisition? First acquisition was um, the Race Tech side of the business. Race Tech, and so so just just kind of like deep dive into that. So. Because, for example, so you, you're growing, you, you're making strategic decisions in terms of what distributors we're going to have, where we're going to have them. At what point do you move away from that and actually start thinking, why not go buy a business who's probably already got contacts, clients, revenue, profit? Well, I think you're driven by, we were driven by necessity. Really? So um, when we started this process, it was difficult to import. Not many companies were doing it, and we were very successful at doing it at that time. Several years later, everybody's doing it. 
Um, simplification of import, input, you know, importing products, documentation, currency, language, communication, all those sorts of things. Um, you know, I come from a time when phone calls used to be one of your biggest overheads. So phoning internationally um, was not only difficult but very expensive. Um, we existed in a time when, um, and ask your mum and dad about it when you get a moment, phoning um, phoning in the morning between nine o'clock and one o'clock was the most expensive time to make a call. <laughs> Wait, then, hold on. There was I know, different, different tiers. Plans. Then if you phone between one o'clock and six o'clock, the cost of the call would come down. So very regularly as a business, most of our calls used to come in in the afternoon because it was cheaper for our customers and their businesses wow. to make phone calls in the afternoon. Crazy situation. And then you'll find that, you know, your mum and your dad, they probably called their mum and dad and brothers and sisters and all that after six o'clock because it's cheaper cheap again. Then. Wow. <laughs> Crazy Working times. But, um, so it was out of necessity. The market for our distribution business was waning. Mm. Um, and when you, when you get into the Parliament High, sell them cheap, progressively what happens is you've got to kind of start adding value somewhere mm. to the um, to the product otherwise you've just got to change your supplier and find somebody who's cheaper to stay put in the marketplace mm. that so we've got a factory there that's becoming more technical more capable they can open up new markets so rather than being in the you know pile them high get big market we wanted to go into the niche market yeah and become more technical uh, technically capable in-house for designing the solution for the client rather than relying on on our partners in the Far East. Yeah. Um, talk, me, talk me through, sorry, I was going to say, how did that purchase even happen? Was it just a matter of approaching them and going, look, I'm looking at buying a business? Uh, yeah. It was, it was your, a, what was the criteria? It was a, an opportune um, discussion. So the, the, the business that we actually bought was, to all intents and purposes, a one-man band. Oh, okay. Uh, um, but he was um, specifically targeting the motorsport industry. And of course, motorsport's a very technical, um, demanding industry. And what he was doing was he would do all of the design work, he'd design the tool, but he'd subcontract the production of the tool to a tooling company. He'd then send the tool off to a rubber molding company and subcontract the production. So although we'd found the kind of direction we wanted to go, the add-on for that was we then actually invested in our own manufacturing capability in Chandler's Ford so that we could do the design and we could do the manufacture yeah. um, and we could supply the product finished to the client. And this was a, an element of partnership with our factory in the Far East because we were doing technical exchange with them. We were using their materials, feeding back because any bulk production they could produce it much lower cost mm. in the Far East than we yeah. could in, in the UK. So it, we went down the niche route that we actually took on the manufacturing, um, and that was a you know hugely successful part of our business in the end. And yeah, just so on that, so so right, acquiring that business, but we're niching down now. Now, yeah, you know, are you were you buying that individual in the business? His contacts? We did you keep him in the business? Well, we we actually bought his. So although he was essentially a one man band, we bought his business. Yeah. Ramped it up. He he retained. Uh, I think it was a third shareholding in that business. So he had a vested interest in yeah. obviously it succeeding and, and staying in the business. Um, and we grew it. Um, that you know by the time um, I left a couple of years ago when we sold that part of the business. I think we were employing uh, nine, ten people on the shop floor. Yeah, um, it's all very bespoke, very small batch, but high. Was that the ring thing you were telling me about, where it's like cheaper to? It was more expensive to sell one off the peg. Was that right? Or was that something else? You said is that the bit you shut down? Uh, no. Oh, no, sorry. No, no, sorry, that's, sorry. no, that's, sorry. no that's that was another. That no, no, no. This, I mean, this was a very profitable part yeah. of the business. Hugely profitable. But it was all small essentially small numbers yeah um you know if you go after the formula one as a, uh, teams as a market we had product on every car wow but there's only 11 teams yeah. so it's not exactly you know and there's not going to be another 10 teams next year i see in the news that there might be a 12th team next year but okay. 
you know. Mm. They used to too um, early. It's <laughs> <laughs> and in reality, you know, a lot of the teams buy bits in that are already built yeah. and made. So it's yeah. um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't all of a sudden massively open up new markets. Yeah, yeah. Um, what what are the, what are the challenges there? Because was that one of how many acquisitions? Was there a few in there? Well, I think the acquisitions that we did over the years. So we acquired um, the um, the race tech side of the business. Yeah. Um, we acquired the pipe fabrication business, PTF Engineering. Um, and at the time we were acquiring that, they acquired a contract, um, which eventually led us into acquiring the water process um, filtration business, which was just a it was a support contract for MOD water purification equipment. Nice. Um, so essentially, it was what it was our customer, and we acquired the customer because um, they wanted to uh, to drop out of that particular market mm. so you know again there are, there are opportunities that are there in front of us but you've got to then look at the best way to exploit mm. the way in which you know you, you you take that business into the for sure organization and scaling gives you you know we've got an accounts department so you can share resources we've yeah. got a warehouse department which can take on activities that um, you know, allows you to be more efficient and more streamlined. So the bigger you become, yeah, the more efficient. So were you becoming more profitable by proxy anyway? Because if you if you're buying all these entities, almost throwing them into one big beast, and obviously as you said, you only need one accounts department, you only need one warehousing department, marketing department, sales department, etc. So even before winning another customer, were you finding it just getting more profitable anyway? There's an element of that, but I think you've also got to be if you understand your numbers you've still got to drive each part of your business to be as profitable as it can be um, so although you can add things into um, becoming a bigger organization which achieve that just by scale um, you know there's certain things that you don't need to have too off just because you're twice the size so yeah you know scale does give you efficiency and profitability yeah um, but you've still got to look into the detail of all of the businesses and make sure they're all managed efficiently and effectively. Yeah. Talk to you about the leadership perspective then, because if we've got all these moving components in the business, you know, how were, uh, of course, back at house, you've got the numbers for each one, but how are these, how are these running operationally? So were you then forced to install like a leadership layer or were you acquiring the people that were in the business already, give them a kind of a stake in there and saying, let's stick with us, we're growing, and it's letting them run the business they had anyway? <laughs> combination of all um, I mean I think um, obviously when you bring businesses together you've got potentially clash of cultures so, how was that was there a clash of culture uh, well, I think we were very lucky but we've you know I think our core culture um, was attractive to other businesses when they came and joined us and they yeah. were only they were only relatively small teams anyway we, were, we didn't acquire huge numbers of people in any one of those um, acquisitions yeah. so I think our core culture we've always tried to make sure we get long serving loyal employees it's a very cost effective way rather than retraining and re-recruiting you know recruitment costs these days are um, mm. you know, horrendous so what, what, do you, what do you think makes a culture? <laughs> I think there's a lot there's a lot you'll read in you know about leadership over management and I think if you if you lead people in a way that gives them enough scope to do their job to the best of their potential and you give them all the the, the skills and the tools to do it mm. then uh, you've got to have the confidence that you step back from it and let them get on with it you've got to be able to give them that freedom um, but I think creating a culture where people are empowered within the business and are a part of a you know a team that is focused on achieving the same thing is is hugely important. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever have trouble, you know, with kind of going through all this growth? Did you ever have trouble, kind of, I suppose, working yourself out of it really, and just letting the operations take place, or did you just know that at times maybe you weren't the best person to be in certain situations, and you need to let the team run the ship? Um, <clears throat> In the original business, I'd done absolutely every job <laughs> right, you know, from top to bottom. So, you know, I knew what it was. Some of it I was better at than others. Yeah. Um, so, but I'd, I'm asking people to do stuff. I know what the job entails and I understand it. 
um, and you've got a good measure then for you know whether the person that you're appointing to that role is going to do it to the best of their ability. Um, as you acquire businesses, you're you know acquired a, a fabrication business. I still don't know how to weld, um, and I've actually I've got a weld set, and they still keep trying to encourage me to have a go at welding. Yeah. So you know you employ people who are craftsmen. They can do that job way better than I can. There's definitely no point in me. So let them get on with it. And yeah. Let the people who know how to manage those people with those skills manage them as effectively. But you've got to bring them into an overall understanding about what the expectation of the business is yeah. and what the targets are and um, you know, working with them to achieve efficiency and productivity. Mm. Um, but you know, I, I haven't got a clue. So, so what would you say were the most you know, you spoke about acquisitions, etc. You know, from from moving into the business early twenties, going through that growth. Right, we're no longer a love stop business. We're becoming a beast. We're acquiring business, etc. So, did all of that happen within what a ten year time span? Was it fifteen years? Um, so at what point did it almost become business as usual, and the business became mature, and you didn't really have to do much for it to like? <coughs> it kind of like grew steadily. Well, when when I first you know bumped into you two guys as part of. Uh, my involvement with Inky Hive yeah. was at a point in time where the business was essentially the management team were running it on a day to day mm. basis. Yeah. So I had time to put into other projects knowing that there are good people making decisions and making yeah. things happen. Yeah. So, you know, it was a mature business at that stage and it had enough critical mass that um you could employ and you could afford to have people in key roles that are making decisions and looking after stuff and taking ownership and mm. responsibility. Yeah. So I you know, I think that was probably it was fifteen to twenty years in, in our example of you yeah. know, how we got there. But it was it was almost because of the way in which my brother and I operated, we kinda of went off in completely different directions to start with. So it was almost yeah. like there was, it was Although there was an element of common strategy there, yeah. they were almost you know, completely autonomous in, in achieving their own success. Yeah. Which well, let's, let's talk about that, because I think it's important, you know, especially from where you took the business initially to kind of where you ended up. You know, how was that relationship throughout the years? Um, for all because because <laughs> doing business partner is one thing, yeah. But having a, having a brother for a business partner as well must be like a whole different yeah. kettle of fish. I think, I mean, you get advantages certainly with family and for anybody who's, you know, trying to do any work with family, you'll you'll understand that there are advantages, but it, they're unique relationships. Yeah. So, you know, responses and um, communication is a completely different um, level than it would be when you're dealing with, you know, people you employ or... Uh, recruit or partner up with through um, you know different methods mm. so um, you know I, I, I certainly um, supported the way in which our business went generally um, but I think you know to be honest I think um, my brother was more in a, a, a comfort zone of mm. the original traditional business so more mm. in tune with lifestyle tight business and being risk averse and not wanting to step into a um, you know a, a, a risk environment investing in big in becoming much bigger than we did yeah um, all of the acquisitions I headed up as they came in yeah. whereas my brother stayed secure in the original business that uh, did it feel um, like you're in a car and you had your foot in the accelerator and he had a, he put in the handbrake up <laughs> Well, I think you know, <laughs> one of the, one of the things I uh, I keep passing on to my son Adam, who you know, is very much about you know personalities. Businesses need different personalities, and I accept that you know you've got um, when you you've got a, 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 a an environment that you've kind of inherited, then you've got to work with that those personalities. Yeah. You guys have had the freedom of choice of making a decision that you've got whatever it makes between you the chemistry that makes you click mm. that you've had the freedom of choice to make that decision that you are prepared to yeah. take that step into a business and I think um, 
you know, the adage that you can choose your friends, you can't choose your family can work for or against you. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was very much, I was very comfortable in being outside, out of my comfort zone and going into yeah. head up the acquisitions, whereas that just wasn't, um, you know, my brother's comfort area. So he, yeah. he preferred to stay in the security and the comfort of the, the traditional business. Do you have any regrets in that business? Um, I'd, I'd like to have exited it earlier. I think my time in that business, because of the way it, it developed, um, you know, I think there was almost, it was a very, mm. you know, when you put in that position where it's failure, you know, isn't an option, there's almost, it's an obligation rather than a, a passion. Um, and so I got, I certainly got to the point where I think, and, and that's, you know, fortunately I'm now in that where I can yeah. draw a line under it and I can approach things in a much more, um, uh, I haven't got the same emotional, negative emotional attachment to it. Yeah, I can do sense. it because I'm more passionate about makes it. Makes sense. Makes sense. And that's you know why I got involved in doing mentoring and things yeah. like that because they're the things that I'm passionate about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about then. So, see, you exited last year, and you know, and I think one of the things I spoke to you about before this is. You know, a lot of people watching this, I suppose, you know, young entrepreneurs, they're not, they're not too mature in their business journey. So is it a bad idea to have dreams of making millions and millions? Uh, I, you know, the world is full of information. You see it on your phone, on, you know, documentaries, YouTube, about a very, very tiny percentage of people that achieve huge success very quickly. It's not the norm by any means. Um, it's a very fine line between setting, I think, dreams and aspirations to achieve that and, and having that as an underpinning motivator to being successful. But I think you've got to be realistic. Um, you know, it's a very small percentage of people. I mean, you know, there are statistics about the earnings of you know, UK um, uh, taxpayers yeah. And if you look at it, the percentage of people in that bracket is it's less than one percent. Really. So you know, statistically, you could be more likely to be in the ninety-nine percent, and the difference between the ninety-ninth percent and the hundredth percent is huge. Really. So I think it's it's being realistic and practical. Um, I've always, I think, you know, my approach is you've got to you've got to look at a business option which is viable. Because there's no point in you know, and I've 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 had people pitching businesses where they're not doing the right research. They don't really understand the markets they're going into. They don't understand the the services or the products. Um, and I can do you know five ten minutes of research and convince them that they haven't got a clue what they're talking about. <laughs> um, and if you're going to go and set up your own business, you do have to have a degree of mm. understanding about what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, so it has to be viable. To start with and your expectation really needs to be set that you can build a business that can pay all your obligations your bills um, satisfy hopefully your own desires to you know eat and drink and live in uh, you know some form of comfort um, and that's the starting point that's that's an essential foundation if you can turn that into a huge you know organization that goes global and turns you into a billionaire that's that's awesome but i think you've got to kind of you know be a, a little bit feet on the ground that that mm. only happens for a tiny number of people mm. and why do you think majority was it what's the I don't know, statistic is 97 percent of the business fell in the first five years why is that is it the business or is it the people running them um it's a number of factors um and, and part of it is why i got involved in inky hive in the first place so um, you know, one of them I've just touched on. People think they're going to go into business, and you know it's easy. Mm-hmm. It isn't, and if you haven't even researched the business or the service that you're going into first, <clears throat> then you know you're setting yourself up for failure. Understanding um, basic requirements of a business, and I think there's so. Uh, I don't know when you guys um, first actually sat down and set up your business but if, if you've got a credit or a debit card 
10 minutes and company's house. Mm. You've got shares, you're now a director, you're now legally responsible for that business and all of the people that that business impacts on. Um, I've met people who've been directors of business for 30 years, haven't got a clue about their actual legal responsibilities as a director. Wow. Um, so certainly from my point of view, it's, it's helping people understand the minimum requirements that you need to understand to build a business that's going to be more than one person at some point in the future. Yeah. Um, Have you ever met an entrepreneur who has been in the business and you can see they're enthusiastic and they're really passionate about it, but you know just through experience and through your lens that it's just not going to work? And, um, and, and do you show them the, do you do them the favour and tell them it's a part of shit? Or do you, do you, let them keep going until they kind of walk into their own banana skin and trip up. It's, it's I mean, it's incredible because I think if, if you've got, if you are an entrepreneur and you've got that spirit and you've got that belief, then, you know, actually tearing somebody's dreams down and, <laughs> and setting fire to them is, um, but the reality is, you know, as I said, I think not with, not with businesses that have actually been up and running, but I've, I've had people pitch businesses to me which will never work. You know their own numbers, and you've only got to watch you know, Dragons Den and some of the numbers that start getting quoted. Um, and if you don't understand numbers in your business and what actually makes it viable and potentially profitable, um, you know I've had guys pitching that are talking about an app, and it sounds wonderful, but two minutes on the App Store, and well, there's already five products out there. They're all cheaper than the one that you know. They're all established. They're all cheaper. Um, and then the numbers that they're throwing about, yeah. and there's four of them, um, go and get a job because you're going to earn more money based on your own numbers. Yeah. It's just not going to succeed. So it's you've got to have the right, um, you've got to surround yourself with the right people in the first place. And just having people that are constantly saying, you know, great idea, go yeah, out and do it. So true. You've got to have people that ground you and, and actually help you through that initial stage of research. And understanding, and it's you know it's a difficult part of the process. Mm. Um, how much do the businesses that are already in your market sector charge for their their, their services? Yeah, you know what's their cost? How are they actually doing it? Have you got the right um, legal requirements for insurance, for licenses, for all of these sorts of things? And I you know I've spoken to food people who want to go into the food industry, no comprehension about you know. The obligations you've got to have for food hygiene and yeah, insurance yeah. and you know it's it's you've got to make sure you do all that yeah. stuff right first. What, what do you, you know? What do you actually think? You know, when we talk about research and planning. You know, there, there's if you Google business plan, you can bet your bottom dollar that you're going to have about a thousand yeah. examples of what that plan should look like. When you're day zero or day, you know, you haven't even launched yet. What and but what 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 do you actually plan for? Because Surely, the initial business plan is like right. Okay, what's our product? What's our service? Who's our customer? How much can we sell it for? What do we think our margin is going to be? Outside of that, what can you realistically plan? Because one thing me and Crystal have had, like, we've had a plan nearly every year in our three and a half four years. But three months into a brand new plan, we've got a brand new plan because of the involve the involvement, right? So, so basically, I suppose, I suppose the question is, is like, how much time do you put into the planning at the start, and then B. How hung up do you get on that when you know you need to change it, if that makes sense? Um, expect it to change. It's, yeah. not, it's not a fixed document. I guarantee you it will change in the direction uh, you have to adapt. You know, As I was saying with some of our businesses, necessity yeah. um, forces you to adapt. I think it depends. So the business plan, it depends who it's for to start with. If you're actually well-funded and it's your own money and you don't mind losing it, then you can make your business plan on the back of a napkin and that's fine, isn't it? Because the only do. person who's... <laughs> well, off 60 quid. Yeah. And, and, and you, if you put your own money in and you risk your own well, money... Mike, then... it was like... <laughs> funny enough, we looked at our last uh, management accounts. It was at the bottom, money owed oh, to yeah. us. 450 quid. Yeah. I think mean, that's the original quid. seed money, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, pretty much. That's it. So, well, business before that number, it was £60 for a camera. For £60, 60 for, a camera, yeah. for a camera, yeah. But funny, that was Laura, mm -hmm. that last couple of hundred quid, that was went into that, 
She was like, I bloody gave you that. <laughs> See you right there. She's like, you owe me Sorry, shares. You owe like, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Um, I'm married now, so that's okay. That's all right. You get, half, you get half of it back now. Um, so I think um, it depends who you're doing it for. If you're going out and you're seeking funding from outside sources, you've got to have a credible document. Mm. Although, you know, that depends who's going to read it and how easily they're going to give yeah, you the money. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're talking to banks and lending institutions, they want absolute chapter and verse. Mm. Um, and their whole mechanism for you know, lending is, is based a lot on money. It's based less on emotion and, and people and, you know, those sorts of things. Mm. Um, so which is why they very, very rarely have anything to do with business startups unless it comes from, you know, credible long term relationships and businesses which are already funding part of it in the background. It has to be accurate. You've got to be honest. There's there's no point in bullshitting numbers in your um, business plan to make it look good if you don't think you can achieve it. Yeah. Um, and I know with you know recent discussions, yeah. How many customers do I think I can get? Well, from zero, it's a very difficult question to ask. But you know, one is a significant percentage increase. Um, two is a smaller percentage, and so on. So it's like. You know, you've got to put it into um, viability and to do that you've got to do the research and it's got to have the right content the numbers for me have always been the telltale if your numbers look right um, and I'll you know I'll spend a couple of minutes looking at the uh, the business content element mm. of it and I'll but I'll really scrutinize the numbers yeah because that's the bit yeah. that ultimately that's the winning um, combination yeah and interesting so just on that so right we've got a plan in place and someone's got a plan in place like I think when I look back at why maybe it took a while for us to get off the runway is because with our first business we, we got lost in the tech we weren't actually solving a problem we just, we just saw this 360 tool tech and we thought wow look how good this is and then we tried to shoehorn it into customers who didn't need it if that makes sense, and hoping they were kind of as mesmerised as we were, but like in our, in our next business, what we what we realised was like it actually came down to the individual skill sets of us to actually go out and generate revenue. So, i.e., actually work we'll work out how do we convince someone that we're the right person to fix their problem. And so, because what I'm trying to get at is like I've met a lot of great entrepreneurs who I think have great ideas, and generally I can I can connect the dots between what they're selling, the problem it's solving. The value of that problem being solved, and, and sense of how much money, how much time, money, and effort that that business might get back, but they but they they don't they don't physically have the skill sets to actually go out and sell. Now, business plan in place without having the ability to sell, you bugger anyway. Would you agree? Um, yes, I mean the, the, one of the big challenges of setting up a business is you've got to have every hat unless you can afford to fund bringing those resources in. So you've got to overcome those fears. If they're genuinely, you know, you can't afford somebody to go out and selling, but it's not a natural environment, you've got to man up and you've got to actually get out there and you've got to make it happen. Um, and I don't think I'm a natural salesman. I don't think that's necessarily my forte. Um, but you know you have to learn skills you have to stand up in front of an audience and present which most people find horrifying yeah but if you're going to run your own business bank on it being something you're going to have to do at some point now you know i've done the scariest presentation i did was to um the entire organization management organization of ex and mobile at Foley refinery and it was a health and safety presentation <laughs> so um scary stuff that's the the most nerve-wracking presentation i've done but you've got to do it you yeah. are the person mm. that the customer is expecting to get up there and and present it. yeah so i think you you know you have to you have to be prepared to step out your comfort zone you're already doing that when you take this first step of um belief that this is going to be a business that's going to work you're yeah. already stepping out of your comfort zone yeah expect that type of thing to come along yeah um and you've got to just get on and, and do it unless you can um recruit resources that are going to do it for you yeah. but most small businesses they they just can't afford that type of mm. 
of luxury. And I just want to touch on something that you, you mentioned earlier, which I think is so important just to reiterate is you mentioned how surrounding yourself with the right people is really important. Now, let's just talk about that. How important is that? Because you, it, especially today where there's millions of business coaches, consultants, experts, who all kind of claim they can revolutionize your business from a leadership <laughs> perspective or strategy or whatever it is, you know, like how important is it A, to vet the people who are advising you in your business? Because one of the big things that we noticed when we started out was, especially when you start out, there's no money in the business, you're not paying yourself, everyone's got an opinion for you. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. And, but the people that are giving you that advice have never done it themselves anyway. No, so, and I, th I think if you if you're in a position where, uh, be it friends, family that have uh, that have got experience in running a business, then you know that's an easy source of support and inspiration in in helping guide you in the things that you're doing. But you're absolutely right with the you know, all of a sudden you get you you set up a business, you'll be bombarded with people who want to come and help you and charge you all sorts of fees for doing it when at a time when you haven't got those sorts of reserves to do it and I liken it to you know I'm sure there are uh, I'm, I'm generalizing but you know if you're sat on a plane and the pilot comes on and says uh, good afternoon we're just gonna you know, take off go on our, our flight to take you all on holiday I haven't actually flown a plane before <laughs> but my co-pilot he's read lots of books and he's told me how to do it and that's essentially what a lot of consultants are well, doing. They haven't so actually been through the process that you're about to go through. So they don't understand the true anxieties and stresses and strains of actually making the decision to go it on your own and start this new venture. Yeah. And the challenges that you're going to face along the way, um, they're going to charge you a fee, they're going to, they're going to succeed. Um, whether you do or not so they haven't got a vested interest in the outcome um, they're just going to raise their invoice and thank you very much on they go yeah. so I think you need to be v extremely careful about the types of um, people that you get involved in, in in supporting your business mentoring which is something which I you know that's yeah. where I first met you guys there are so many successful business people that would happily give mentoring time and support to you know young entrepreneurs um, find them there's you know there's networks for them don't go out and think you know spending big sums on on consultants is the solution I think you need to find people and potentially within your industry as well which is even more relevant mm -hmm. you know, they're happy to uh, to support um, you know new businesses getting up and running that's Mm. This country has, has, you know, succeeded for many, many years above the uh, the rest of the world because of the business understanding, capability, and technology, yeah. and the growth that we've seen through uh, through many years. So, yeah. try and find people that will do that, and 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 you know, th there's inspirational YouTube videos. There's all sorts of things, and you know, if you've got a specific problem, great, find somebody that can help you with it. But if you want general motivation and support and just somebody to listen to, you know, some of the challenges, there's there are people out there that will do it. Yeah, yeah. And so that you know, obviously ACID last year. What does what does life look like for you now moving <laughs> forwards? Um, well I you know, very deliberately the part the whole process of setting up and being part of Inky Hive was that's one of the things I'm passionate yeah. about and can get involved to when I actually get to this point. <coughs> Still deciding if I'm unemployed or, uh, or <laughs> um, so. Did it, did it scare you, by the way, in terms of like not I'm not any guy, but it scare you in the sense of like now being moving into this phase of your life now, where it's like it it didn't scare me because I've seen so many people that have gone into that environment yeah. and seen how it's affected them, and and I don't I I really don't think people fully appreciate. Um, retirement and the impact it can have on them, you know, mentally. I think it's it's a lot different now. You know, um, retirement age technically doesn't exist, so you're not forced into this point where you've got to exit. Yeah. 
um, you know, people are living longer, so they even if they go off and do something completely different, yeah, um, you're not in that position where you've got to, you know, 65 arrives and thank you very much. Um, there's the door. Um, so it is. It, it's 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 not the same um, scary place that it used to be. But I know people who've massively looked forward to retiring and then just ended up in this vacuum and don't know what actually what to do. Mm. Um, and it it can be. You know, quite a difficult place to be in. So, so what, what's what's made you want to actually go into mentoring and help young entrepreneurs? You know, why aren't you just on a yacht somewhere nine months of the year? Um, I am. I'm mean, actually <laughs> three months of the year. <laughs> <laughs> um, mentoring for me, mentoring's giving something back. You know, I've been very fortunate, been successful in 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 our businesses. Um, you know, and that's any successful business has so many. Uh, relationships that have to support one successful business is based around lots of other successful businesses so sharing some of that success and helping the next generation of entrepreneurs to succeed is kind of the way to to give back and make sure the economy of this um, you know this country does continue to thrive as it has in the past um, and it's the bit actually that I enjoy yeah I mean it's you know, I don't think I'm massively clever. But well, I've, we know that, Mike. We've got one CSE. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, a couple of O levels. <laughs> Academically, I mean, you know, how how do you measure people's intelligence here? We've got a system in this yeah. country which is a one fits all um, system, and it measures people who academically are, are absolutely off the chart, but achieve nothing yeah. in real terms. And people who don't achieve anything academically go on to achieve massive success. So it's about what's passionate, what makes you happy. And, you know, if you're going to do a business for 40 years, make sure it's something you enjoy because <laughs> it's a long time to be miserable. Um, but I think, you know, I've just had experience. So things that I can share with you guys that might sound, you know, revolutionary, it's not. It's just that I've been there and I've, yeah. I've had those challenges presented to me and I've seen solutions that can actually make a massive difference to your business and, yeah. and whilst you're in the thick of it sometimes you know being able to step back and just take a bit of time and my advice has always been if you if you consider yourself a manager managers have to have time to manage if you're just doing stuff all the time you're not actually managing and as directors and owners you're you've got huge responsibilities for managing the success of your business you've got to take time out to understand where you are and where you potentially can go mm. um, and that's incredibly important you can get bogged down in all of the detail mm. and not actually appreciate that you know it's all going completely right or wrong somewhere and you've got no understanding of what's what's actually making that happen mm. the risk of being a busy fool right mm. absolutely yeah, yeah. And um, I think I think I think finally from us, you know, you you're mentoring, of course, you know, Mike's mentoring us, by the way, and you know, we've only just started doing it probably over the last month, but already uh, the challenges are being thrown our way, but which are beautiful challenges, by the way, and it's it's helping us, I suppose, actually refine what we got here. I think that's the biggest thing for us, you know, being able to, because it's like the conversation we had the other day, you know, we got fancy dashboards in here and stuff, and. Mike's just sat there, we're all proud of them, look at these beautiful dashboards. And Mike's like, yeah, what was that actually telling you? And we're like, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but, but to anyone who might be interested in getting in touch with you, Mike, what's the best way to contact you? If you'd like to be contacted in retirement. Facsimile? Or telex. You find, you find him done a job centre done done most Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt you probably won't even find a YouTube on the telex <laughs> these days. Um, um, I, I, how you post this and you know by all means link it to my LinkedIn or whatever yep. and people can nice. get hold of me through that um, oh, so, so we'll tag Mike uh, we'll put some contact information there as well um, and if you feel like you just love a conversation with Mike just drop him an email and uh, I'm sure will be in touch as and when he's uh, in the country and not on a yacht somewhere <laughs> nine months of the year so, the invitation. and the call will be after six o'clock because that's when it's at cheap it's cheap <laughs> But no, on a crazy. Serious, yeah. But no, Mike, on a serious note, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Um, 
you know, we're looking forward to working with you. Mm, very much. No, 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 I'm looking forward to working with you guys. You've always mm. shown great enthusiasm and passion, and yeah. you know, for what you're uh, what you're doing and everything you've. Even going back to you know pressure washing, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fresh, yeah. pressure washing patios yeah. and things yeah. that you've done in the past. We I think you know we I won't did... talk about the shorts, but <laughs> the pink ones. <laughs> sure. well, I still wear those, mate. Only when you're out, put the jeans on. But you I a pressure washes your mate's uh, decking. Oh, you did. I think yes. yeah, John. got yeah, tenner for that. Yeah, it was yeah. awesome. Awesome. <laughs> the glory days. So you know, um, yeah. no, you've always shown great enthusiasm, and I think you know they're the foundations you need to take that plunge and take that first step um, yeah you guys have got it in bucket falls and Thanks, hopefully man. I can support you in a way that um, you know gives you increasing success in the future you will got no doubt Thanks, no man. doubt guys there's break the mold episode two uh, with Mike Worley wherever you get your podcast subscribe and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next one Mike great to see you thank you for your time thank you, mate. welcome thank you very much